Now here we are again for another DCF program for the month of February and we're delighted to be able to send it out with all those who take part in it and we pray that it will be a real blessing to you and it's a joy to know that so many of you are listening to it and watching the program month by month and also the DVDs and the CDs that go out and praise the Lord today for the blessing that it has been and the persons who have shared with us and brought God's word, we're just delighted. We want you to sit back, relax and be challenged and enjoy this wonderful and precious ministry and message that we share with you today. So we're going to start with our choruses. That's the usual format. And we're going to open up with a lovely chorus today. I know the Lord will make a way for me. If I live a holy life, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will make a way for me. <laughs> I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me. If I live a holy life, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me. I know the Lord will make a way for me. If I live a holy life, shun the wrong and do the right, I know the Lord will make a way for me. Now that's a lovely opening chorus and I want Yvonne to introduce the next chorus for us just now. So let's hear you Yvonne. Well he chose that one and I chose this one and I would like you to choose yours as well. And so in the next few weeks if you can put pen to paper or tell your leader your favourite chorus we'll make sure we put it up on the next programme. But this is a favourite of mine. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he can do for you. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. Secret, what God can do, what He's done for others, He'll do for you. With arms wide open, He'll pardon you. It is no secret. Now the programs that we are producing and sending out and being supported in this by so many people in our province in Northern Ireland and today we are so appreciative of all that help and support. But the desire of our hearts is that you will be blessed if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Saviour and that you will be saved if you don't yet know the Lord. We desire that you should be born again of the Spirit of God. This is a chorus which we have not had on our programs before. The question is, do you know that you've been born again? You can, 
And if you don't know that, well, it's very important that you do. And we pray that through this program, the Lord will bring you to himself. So listen to the words of this chorus. Do you know that you've been born again? Do you know that you've been born again? Does the Spirit dwell within, bearing witness that you've been cleansed from every sin and stain? Are you ready if the Lord should come, or today your soul should claim? Can you face eternal years, free from doubt and dread and fears? Do you know, know, know that you've been born again? Do you know that you've been born again? Do you know that you've been born again? Does the Spirit dwell within? That you've been cleansed from every sin and stain Are you ready if the Lord should come Or today your soul should claim Can you face eternal years free from doubt and dread and fears Do you know, know, know that you've been born again Jesus said to a very well-known man and a very religious man, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And if that was so for him, then it's true and it's so for all of us. And we need to know that we are born again, born of God's Spirit and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we go any further today, let's just unite our hearts in prayer together. Lord Jesus, we thank you today that you came into this world to seek and to save that which was lost. And we know that if you had not come, then we would have no Savior to proclaim today. But because you came and lived and died in our place and on our behalf, Lord, we thank you today that we can come now knowing that Jesus Christ is no longer on a cross, no longer in a tomb, but alive and able to save men and women and young people everywhere. And so we pray that this day you will speak into the hearts of those who listen to the program here on DCF and YouTube and the DVDs and the CDs. And, oh God, we pray that somebody will be truly born again of the Spirit of God, through this program. Thank you for those who are going to be sharing in our program today. We pray that you will bless their ministry to all our hearts. Be with the friends today in care homes and residential homes. And dear Lord, bless all the different DCF branches and the leaders and helpers. We pray that you will be with them too today in their homes. Dear Lord Jesus, we ask these things in your precious name and for your glory. Amen. Now, Yvonne, we have some people taking part today, mm -hmm. haven't we? Mm -hmm. Who have you got today for us to start off our program to well, share in the first song? I was going to say an old friend, but I'll change that. A good friend of ours, May Crooks. She's been singing for a long, long time. And May's going to sing a beautiful hymn, I Cannot Tell. I cannot spare 
Well, I wonder, does Jesus mean as much to you as he means to me? I cannot tell how much you mean to me, precious Lord, Lamb of Calvary. Thank God today he is our everything. He is our all. We're delighted for that. It's not only a pleasure to have someone who has been singing for many years and has a great record of ministry and song in many different places, but someone who is young, someone who has started out to sing, and we trust and pray that she will sing for the Lord Jesus as she grows older. She is one of our granddaughters, Tabitha Agnew. She lives near Edinburgh in Scotland, and she's going to sing, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. songs that we have been listening to, the Lord has been speaking into your heart perhaps today as well. But now we're going to come to the word today, the message. And we've got a good friend that we've known for many, many years. His name is Jonathan Reed. Jonathan and his wife Patricia live near Ballymena. And I've known Jonathan since he was a little boy of about 10 years of age. And I remember him very well coming to a mission that we had back in those days, 1969 actually it was. And over the years that Jonathan has been growing up and growing older, he has served the Lord for many, many years. And he and Patricia were part of the great ministry of Child Evangelism Fellowship for many years. They also have served the Lord in various church circumstances and situations, and Jonathan has been blessed in his ministry in the glens of Antrim and in other towns as well around the Balamina region. He loves to speak of Jesus, and especially when he gets the opportunity to speak to people one to one. 
He's a personal evangelist as well as a man of ministry just like you're going to hear now. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Jonathan Reed from Kells in County Antrim as our guest speaker for the program today. And after Jonathan speaks to us and shares with us in his ministry today, we're going to have Mildred Rainey then to sing at the end, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." So with no further ado, here is Jonathan and then Mildred to close out our program and then I will just pronounce the benediction. Well, friends, it's a real privilege to come this evening uh, and to be able to bring the gospel of saving grace. Or today, it may be in that case, if you're going to listen to this online, it may be during the day. I'm going to read a few verses here from Acts chapter 9. It is about the conversion of Saul. I'm not going to read all the verses because it's quite a long chapter, but we'll read a number of the verses together. Acts chapter 9, and we'll read verses 1 uh, to the verse 18. 1 to verse 18. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether the men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand, and brought him to Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire at the house of Judas, for one called Saul of Tartus, for behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen a vision of a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many things of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that is called in thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name among the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, E Jesus, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way thou camest, hath sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight and forthwith arose and was baptized. Amen. And we know that God will add his blessing to the public reading of his precious, precious word. If you wanted a title for the little sermon I'm going to preach today, it is the Lord Jesus Christ can save sinners. He said, I did not come to call the righteous people that think they're proud righteous people to repentance, but sinners to repentance. Those are the people that the Lord Jesus Christ loved. And in fact, when they said he was a friend of publicans, tax collectors and sinners, that would have been a compliment to the Lord Jesus. And let me just say this, folks, by way of introduction, that ought to be a compliment of every Christian. That they would never pass by someone on the street because they're not dressed right, because they're drunk, because they're a person of low, low esteem in the eyes of others. A true believer will have pity on a person like that. But you know, it matters not whether an individual is a self-righteous sinner or someone who has committed some dreadful uh, crimes. All outside of the Lord Jesus Christ are on their way to a Christless eternity. Someone told me one time about someone being in the clean side of the broad road, but the Bible does not make any distinction in that. There's no distinction. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 13, Enter in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in there at. 
You know something? Everybody has broken God's commandments and that's what sin is. It's breaking the commandments of Almighty God. God says, don't take my name in vain and you do it. God says, make no idol, second commandment and you do it. God says, uh, dear friends, that you're not to covet and people have done that. People have hated some people in their hearts and wished they were dead and others murder. And so on we go through those commandments. But here we have today a man who was a self righteous person who was a sinner who came to the feet of Jesus and Saul then became a preacher of righteousness of Christ being the only way of salvation. So first of all I want us to look at this Saul a sinner who was a self-righteous sinner. What does the Bible tell us about us who are sinners? It tells us in the book of Ezekiel we are desperately wicked in the sight of God. And an example of the, sinless, sin, the, the sinfulness of this man whose name was Saul of Tarsus. And verse chapter 1 begins with him breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the dear children of God. He hated the people of God. He hated the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely and utterly hated him. And you know something? He was going away to Jerusalem, you'll notice. And what he was doing from Jerusalem to Damascus... He was trying to get men and women who were of the way that he might bring them to Jerusalem. That was what he wanted to do. There were people of the way because Jesus said in John 14 and 6, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. What sort of wickedness was he guilty of? He was guilty of the murder of the Lord's people. He put them to prison and had them put to death. But not only that, we see a very blatant example of his wickedness in Acts 7 and 58. He kept the clothes of those who murdered Stephen. When they brought him out after Stephen had given his uh, prophecy about them and spoke about them, been stiff-necked and like their fathers of old that killed the prophets, you remember they took him out and began to stone him to death. And where was Saul? He was minding the clothes of those that murdered Stephen, that stoned him to death. And in fact, he even refers to this in Acts 22 and 20 when he's at Jerusalem. And this is what he says. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I was also standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the clothes of them that slew him. This was Saul of Tarsus. An absolutely sinful person. And it says in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. And Saul was consenting of his death. That is Stephen's death. And at that time there was great persecution against the church at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea, Samaria. Except the apostles. He was frightening the people of God by his words as well as by his actions. You know, if you love the Lord as your saviour, don't be afraid of people who condemn us as Christians. Don't let them make you fear. Jesus said, fear not. If you look at the word of God, it says, fear not even though briars and thorns be with thee. Don't be afraid, says Jesus. Fear not them that can kill the body, but them that can kill the soul. And no doubt, this man, Saul, was in the middle of everything. He was the leader of this great persecution. The Bible makes it abundantly clear that all of us are sinners. It doesn't matter whether you think I've been baptized, I've been confirmed, I take communion. If you're not saved by God's sovereign grace and you've not the witness that Wesley had within your life that your sins are forgiven, friends, you come short of the glory of God. In other words, you cannot reach the target. Like someone shooting arrows at a target, he always comes deadly short of that target. And what does the Bible say in Jeremiah 17 and 9? The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Many today are the right self-righteous sinners that persecute the true Christian of the true Christian minister who preaches the gospel. Oh, they don't want to be told you need to be saved. They're even in our churches today. And you know something that's a terrible thing when people who are at church condemn their minister because he preaches the truth of the gospel. But friends, I want you to notice secondly, he was desperately self-righteous. How do I know he was desperately self-righteous? Because in Philippians 3 verses 5 and 6, we read what he says in verse 5. 
he talks about a circumcision. He says he was circumcised. That's what he says. But what is the place circumcision today but the baptism of little children? But he felt because of a circumcision, this had something to do with salvation. And there's some people believe because I'm baptized, you know, I'd be going to heaven. But, you know, the water of baptism is only a symbol of the precious blood that can save you. If your church does that with children, it's only a symbol of the blood of Jesus Christ that one day will save you and bring you to a saving knowledge of Christ. You must make that decision later or even when you're a child that you're going to come to Christ and be saved. And then he says, I'm of the stock of Israel. He wasn't a proselyte, one who was converted from the Gentile world into Judaism. He was born a descendant of Abraham. And you might say, well, I've been born a Methodist, a Baptist. I've been born a Church of Ireland. I've been born a Presbyterian. I've been born a Pentecostal. My father even was that and all the rest of it. I'm a good Protestant. But a good Protestant isn't going to save dear friends. With all the privileges you have, being a Protestant, hearing the gospel in all its true and full way, that will never save you unless you come to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might save you and take away your sins in his precious blood. He then speaks of his family. He says, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. My father was a Hebrew, my mother was a Hebrew, and I am a Hebrew. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, which was the darling son of Jacob, the, the favoured tribe and what is said of benjamin in deuteronomy 33 and 12 the beloved of the lord shall dwell safely by him and the lord shall cover him all the day and he shall dwell between his shoulders you know your family can be in leadership in the church i remember going to see a man in a care home one time and he kept boasting to me about his nephew who is a presbyterian minister but that man was not saved even though your family, your, your son may be a minister, your brother may be a minister, you have somebody maybe in the eldership of the church, maybe you have somebody who's a missionary today, somebody who's a deaconess in the church today, somebody that's doing something for God in the church, a missionary for the Lord. But that doesn't make you a Christian, friends. You've got to come to Christ yourself. There's, they cannot save you. There's nothing they can do. Only Christ can save you today. He says, come unto me and him that cometh to me. I will not cast out. But what about his education? Well, I didn't have much of an education. I left school at 15, fixed pump years in a garage. All the friends of mine went to Portadown College when this little dunce was mucked from head to toe in oil, grease and dirt and everything else. He says, I am a Pharisee. I was brought up under the feet of Gamaliel, who is an eminent doctor of the law. And, and you know, when he was at, um, at the council that were challenging him, he said in Acts 23 and 6, he says, I'm a Pharisee, I'm the son of a Pharisee. And of course, he set them against the Sadducees at that particular time. He knew his Bible. He knew it off by heart. Many parts of the Old Testament he had been taught under the feet of Gamaliel, where he was from the feet of 13. But even though he knew the scriptures, even though he knew Isaiah 53, what did he do? He persecuted the church for that was a seal we find out. And what was his testimony, dear friends, touching the righteousness of the law? He said, I was blameless. John MacArthur says this, the standard of righteous living advocated by God's law. Paul outwardly kept this so no one could accuse him of viola violation. Obviously, his heart was sinful and self-righteous. He was not an Old Testament believer, but he was a New Testament legalist. Could that be you today, a New Testament legalist? Never, ever being born again of the Spirit of God. But friend, let us go on. Paul said a little later in, 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 in Philippians, he says, But those things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. And he says, I count all of my self-righteousness as dung. But notice, secondly, Saul a sinner at the feet of Jesus. On his way to Damascus in chapter 9 here, breathing out threatenings against the Lord's people in chapter 8. The man is absolutely filled in verse 9 of his hatred as he breathes out those threatenings. He's coming to arrest those in Damascus. He's got letters from the high priest. He's on his way and no doubt he's as proud as a peacock as he sits on the pony on his way down. His zeal was furious. His hatred was raw. But notice... He that would arrest others was arrested himself by the great judge of all the earth. 
Notice in verse 3, the Lord in his sovereignty intervenes. It says suddenly there shone around him a light from heaven. And you know something? Jesus intervened. And here this proud Pharisee falls from his horse and finds that he's biting the dust. And what appears to him? Jesus, who is the light of the world, I am the light of the world. You don't want to see the light of the world in our state, friends, because the minute he looked up and saw the light shine in his eyes, he was blinded in a moment's time. And Jesus spoke to him and said, Saul, verse 3, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the pricks or the goads that they poked cattle with. His imprisoned spirit was wakened. Wesley said these great words and this is what happened Saul quite rightly Ephesians 2 and verse 1 you have thee quickened long my imprisoned spirit lay fast bound in sin and nature's night thine eye diffused a quickening way I woke the dungeon flame with light my chains fell off my heart was free I rose went forth and followed me can you imagine hearing that voice that awakens him from a spiritual death my friends, have you ever heard that voice awakening you? Do you know it was Wesley that heard that voice at Aldersgate? And what does he say? He says, I felt my heart strangely warmed. Hallelujah. I felt I trusted in Christ and in Christ for salvation. And an assurance was given to me in that day. Glory to God. You can be saved and you can know it. You can know that you're saved. If you don't listen to his voice, do not harden your heart as the Bible says. Bible says today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. If you hear God speaking even now, bow your head and trust Christ as your saviour. You know, Saul was on that road and he was trembling. He was afraid. He, he recognises the Lord Jesus has come to him. He says, who art thou, Lord? Jesus said what he said to Moses in the wilderness. He says, I am Jesus. I am. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the great I am that I am. The great I am had now come to him. And he's met more than his, more than his much. He that shouted orders now obeys Jesus. In verse 6, he would have him been brought down into Damascus. And he's going to a narrow street. That's why the Bible calls it straight to the house of Judas. And he's led to the house of Judas. Then knock on the door and he goes in. And this man is thinking to himself about Stephen and the tears coming down his face and the words of Stephen, Lord, lay not the sin to his charge. Those around about him, they heard a voice but saw no man, but they couldn't understand what they heard. Christ had revealed himself to Saul of Tarsus, but not to those that were round about them. Oh, dear friends, today if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Don't harden your heart. I plead with you as an evangelist, come to Christ today. But thirdly and lastly, Saul, a preacher of Christ, the way from verses 10 to 17. Now I want you to think of poor Ananias. Ananias. There was a certain disciple named Ananias and the Lord said, it isn't Ananias. He said, behold, here I am. And he tells Ananias what he has to do. He tells him to go down to the straight seat and there he'll find Saul. And he says, behold, <laughs> look, the persecutor is on his knees and he's praying. And Ananias is frightened out of his wits. He says, Lord, I've heard many things about this man, what he has done to thy servants. How he was coming here with letters to arrest those that believed in your name. And God said, Ananias, go your way. For I will show him what things he will suffer for my sake. He is a chosen vessel unto me. Sometimes, you know, as believers... You can be afraid, dear child of God, to witness to that person. But remember, if you go out with God's grace, he'll give you the help you need to witness to somebody he sends you to. And he obeys his Lord. God tells this dear saint what he's about to do. And you know, I love, he goes down into that house, he knocks the door, he's maybe the sweat's rolling off my stress, he's in fear and trembling. He goes into the house, he says, a Saul here. He goes into a room and there is the great persecutor. There is the evil man that was coming to do him harm. He's on his knees. The tears are running down his face. Jesus has now saved him. He saved him on the Damascus road. He baptized him with the Holy Ghost on the Damascus road. But now something was going to happen. He was going to be given power to serve. And so does it say, I love these words in verse 17 of Acts 9. 
Ananias comes in, puts his hand on the on this man who is praying. He puts his hand on him for a very different reason than Saul was going to put his hands on him. And the love of God fills his heart. And what does he say? He says, not my enemy Saul. He says, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, even Jesus that appeared unto you in the way, hath sent me that ye may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. He was now being filled with the Holy Ghost for service. What a comfort these gracious words broke to this broken soul, full of godly sorrow that led him to repentance. The stranger calls him brother and lays hands on him, and he is filled with the Holy Ghost. His life is now transformed. He has changed. He is absolutely a different person than he was before. The Bible says in verse 19 and 20, he received food. And he was greatly strengthened. They bring him to meet with the new disciples and they're afraid. But Ananias introduces him and they're comforted when they see him in verse 20 the way he was. And then what do we see this man doing in closing? We see him doing what every new believer ought to do. In verse 20 it says he goes out and begins to preach Christ. He's now a new creature. You see 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away and all things become new. You know, friends, when someone is saved, truly saved, and you meet them, your first reaction is to glorify God. You know what St. Paul said, interestingly enough, writing to the church in Galatia, he said this in Galatians 1, 23 and 24, but they heard only that he that persecuted us in time past now preaches the faith with once he destroyed, and they glorify God in me. Oh, hallelujah. Isn't it wonderful that you can be saved, that others can rejoice because you, your life is transformed by the power of God. Paul went out and immediately confessed Christ. Why is it so many Christians are not enjoying Jesus? Listen to Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess like Paul thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes to righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Thus exactly what this man Saul did. Saul was a self-righteous sinner who is awakened by the Lord Jesus on the Damascus road, becomes a preacher of the faith that he sought to destroy. Let me ask you, dear friends, now in closing, maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you say, oh, Jonathan, I'm a wicked sinner like Saul. Oh, I, I'm so evil in my heart and I've done terrible things. You know, friends, Jesus didn't come to call righteous people, but sinners to repent. Maybe you say, but I, you know, I'm a self-righteous person. I walk on the, 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 the I, I talk about walking on the good side of the broad road. But friends, throw down your arms of rebellion and cast all your self-righteousnesses. It's only like dung, says Paul. Do away with it all that you might win Christ. Come to him. He will receive you. He never turns anybody away that comes repentance. And then, friends, you can become a preacher of the way. Tell others about him. What Jesus Christ has done for you. May God bless all that are listening to this word today. Amen. That's just a moment of prayer. Father, we pray that you will write your words upon the hearts of all that listen. And that, Lord, you would save precious, never dying souls this day. For Jesus' sake. Amen. so sweet to trust in Jesus just to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise just to know thus says the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I've proved him Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, 
Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I've proved Him o'er and o'er Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him Well, may the Lord bless you all today and be with you. We're always praying for the DCF people, aren't we, Yvonne? And we're praying that the Lord will be with you as the days get longer and that the Lord's hand will be on your life. We pray that this program has been a blessing to you. Now let's close with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we commit to you all that has been said and all that we have heard through the messages and song today. And we pray that as we now close our program, that you will be with our friends and all those who have followed us this month again until we bring another program on on YouTube and on DVD and CD for DCF, Disabled Christians Fellowship, Northern Ireland. O oh Lord, be with us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.